Hey guys, Mr. Hill with uh, Team Michigan State here at Owsley Junior High School. And today we're going to be talking about this period of time in Texas when American settlers, also called Anglo-American settlers, those are settlers of, of English descent, uh, whose families came to the United States years before uh, from England uh, and started this group of, of American citizens who had English blood um, and referred to, if you remember from our key terms in our last unit, Anglo-Americans. So Anglo-Americans had started uh, being allowed to come into Texas thanks to the efforts of Stephen F. Austin and several other um, impresarios or businessmen who who are allowed to bring settlers into Mexico and, and settle on the Mexican land. And after a while, uh, more and more of these Anglo-Americans start coming in. And yes, they had had to, um, they had had to convert to Catholic. They had had to swear an oath of loyalty to the Mexican government and become Mexican citizens. They were expected to have good moral character. They were expected to be hard workers. And they brought all this with them. They did these things. But at the same time, they had a very difficult time giving up that American identity. So when they came to Texas, instead of becoming more like the other Mexican citizens, the true Tejanos who lived in Texas, instead of becoming like that, they stayed very true to their American roots. And over time, these cultural differences between the Anglo-Americans and the Mexican authorities there in, in Texas, it began to cause a problem. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about how Mexico noticed these issues and what they did to sort of slow it down or to try to stop the Americans from being too quote unquote American. So first thing is we have our Texas history key terms, which you should have already filled out your unit five key terms packet at this point. Our first key term is the term garrison. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. If you haven't filled out your key terms packet, obviously I'd like you to do that. I should have probably said this from the beginning, but you have in Canvas a link to a Google Doc version of the C notes that go with this presentation. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to watch this presentation and as you reach a point where you need to write down the notes, you can pause the presentation uh, or pause the video and you can go in and uh, and fill in your notes and then you can go back to the video and, and you can start it up again. Um, there are different ways to do this. This is going to give you the closest approximation to the way we do it in class. And I think that's lacking right now in a lot of your work is you're doing these things, but you're not doing it the way that we normally do in class and it's hurting your grades. So a garrison is another word for troops or soldiers who are stationed in a fortress or in a town and they're there to defend it. So a garrison is not a building. It is not a, a fortress. A garrison is actually what you call the troops that are stationed in a fortress or in a town. Republic. Now, every day um, you well, in, in normal times, you would come to school and you would hear the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and it's, uh, it goes, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands for. Now, a republic is a type of government. A republic is a type of government in which the people vote for their representatives. So, um, the United States is a republic because we vote for people who then represent us in the government, whether it be in Washington, in Austin, um, or even here in Arlington for our local uh, government officials like mayor and city council and school board. The Mexican Constitution of 1824. Now, we've talked about this obviously before. Um, 
the thing we want to know about the Mexican Constitution of 1824 here, though, is that it was the Constitution, a plan of government, and in that plan of government, it combined Texas with the Mexican state of Coahuila to make the state of Coahuila y Tejas, or Coahuila in Texas. Now, this is a map of Coahuila y Tejas, and you'll recognize this portion of Texas here, it, it pretty much looks just like the, what we know of East and North Central Texas, but you'll notice it doesn't have that, that normal uh, Texas kind of star shape to it, with El Paso being out here, and then the, you can see the Rio Grande comes down here and would flow out. Um, the south border of Texas back in, in with the creation of Coahuila y Tejas, the southern border of Texas was actually a river here called the Nueces River. Um, and that's going to come into play um, in our next unit when we talk about the, uh, the border of Texas and between Texas and Mexico. All right. So just keep that in mind. Texas looked much different back when uh, settlers were coming from the United States into Texas. Now, the thing to remember is that Coahuila y Tejas was a state uh, that combined those two states, and Texas was full of mostly Anglo-Americans, and Coahuila was full of mostly Mexicans. So you see that this larger portion up here was made up of mostly American settlers, and this lower portion here, Coahuila, was made up mostly of Mexican people whose families had been in Mexico for, you know, hundreds of years. Our next key term is militia. Militia are civilians who come together to fight as soldiers in case of an emergency. Uh, years ago, when Texas was so... Um, was so rural, it was so country, it, it didn't have a lot of big cities and things like that. There weren't a lot of places, there weren't a lot of soldiers, there weren't forts uh, that were convenient to send soldiers in case of an emergency, like an Indian attack or, or bandits or whatever. So a militia was a group of just citizens, maybe a, a, a banker, a, a blacksmith, an innkeeper, uh, store owner, and then just farmers who, if there was an emergency, they dropped their plows or they dropped their pins or they dropped their, you know, whatever tool it is that they use in their work, and they would pick up their guns, jump on their horses, and they would go to fight uh, to protect the, the land and the people in the land. Okay, <clears throat> mini bios. Our first and actually our only mini bio with this uh presentation is a man named Hayden Edwards. Hayden Edwards was an American impresario, meaning he was an American who came to Texas uh, and his goal was to bring settlers with him and settle a large piece of land. Uh, and in the process, he would make money and he would become a, a landowner also. Um, the problem is he tried to turn his colony into its own nation. Um, he got angry at the Mexican government and he said, you know what, to heck with you guys, I'll just take my land and I will make it into its own separate country. Uh, unfortunately for Edwards, he failed and was forced to return to the United States. So we'll get into a little more detail about um, his rebellion and, uh, and how it failed here in just a moment. Um, this is a quick guide if anybody's doing their C notes at home, just a quick reminder uh, of how to set that up if you're doing your C notes on a sheet of paper. Uh, pretty simple. Most of you who are in AVID, you're probably taking your notes like this anyway. Um, but uh, remember, if you take a piece of paper, mark off a section at the top, that'll be your title and your essential question. Um, you'll have a column on the left for questions that you will write that will help you study uh, and you'll write those questions from your notes section. Uh, same thing on the back, and then down at the bottom on the back, you'll have a summary. Uh, I know this is different than some of your C notes. Um, a lot of people do the summary on the front, but because we're filling in notes, if you're doing them on, by hand, um, 
you'll do notes that'll fill in the front and the back. So I figured it's best just to do the summary on the back. Okay, so your title uh, of this set of notes is Mexico Imposes Authority. And your essential question today, how did Mexico try to control Anglo settlers in Texas? How did Mexico try to control Anglo settlers in Texas? Well, we start out by talking about something called the Freedonian Rebellion. The Freedonian Rebellion. Hayden Edwards, an American impresario, declared independence from Mexico because of uh, uh, some run-ins that he had with the Mexican government. Um, Hayden Edwards, when he got his land grant, he was told by the Mexican government that there were already Mexican settlers um, on the land that he had been given and that he was to allow them to stay on that land. Um, well, when he went to his, his colony and started bringing in settlers, he started trying to run the Mexican settlers off, even though they had owned that land for, you know, maybe as, as much as 150, 200 years. Um, he um, ran into, uh, sorry, probably more like 100 years, not, not 150, 200 years, but like 100 years, their families had lived on this land. And it, it, it became a problem for those people because there were threats of violence from Hayden Edwards and his rabble rousing American settlers. Um, and the Mexican government had to get involved. And when they did, uh, Edwards declared independence. Now, um, Hayden Edwards called his new country Fredonia. And you can see here from the map where it was. It was actually not too terribly far from the Gulf of Mexico. It was also close to the Sabine River, which is the border between Texas and Louisiana over here. So um, it's also the, the town of Nacogdoches is in the northeast corner of Hayden Edwards colony. And you can see that his colony actually butts up against and touches Stephen F. Austin's colony here. So the Fredonian Rebellion was stopped when the Mexican army uh, rode into Texas and were joined by the militia uh, from Stephen F. Austin's colony. Austin um, had made it clear to his followers that they were Mexican citizens and he expected his citizens to, to abide by Mexican law and they didn't want to cause trouble. They wanted to be good Mexican citizens. So when this American comes in and starts causing problems, even though Austin's settlers were Americans, they now considered themselves Mexican citizens and they did not want this crazy American Hayden Edwards coming in and causing trouble because it would reflect poorly on um, on the other Americans that were in Texas. So it was stopped, uh, but the rebellion worried Mexico. Uh, it made them very concerned um, that other, other American, Anglo-Americans were gonna try to do the same thing eventually. So this led to the Mir y Tehran tour. And here we have a little, this is the flag of Fredonia that, uh, um, uh, Hayden Edwards and his, and his people put together. Uh, but like I said, it, it did not fly very long before they had to give up and go back to, uh, the United States. So general Manuel de Mir y Tehran, uh, was a Mexican general who was ordered to lead an expedition to Texas. After the failed Fredonian Rebellion, when the Mexican government got worried about what was going on in Texas with these crazy Anglo-Americans coming in, they wanted to find out, because Texas was so far away from Mexico City, the capital of Mexico, the Mexican government was just curious of what was going on in Texas, and they, they sent Mir y Tehran to find out. So he toured Texas, he toured the Anglo settlements uh, because he wanted to see if they were adapting to life as Mexican citizens. He wanted to see if they were living, um, you know, speaking Spanish, if they were practicing the Catholic religion, if they were, uh, you know, doing, following the laws of Mexico. Now, here's an interesting little factoid. Uh, in 1832, which was about uh, four years after um, 
Miri Tehran toured Texas, he became so depressed at the bickering inside the Mexican government over Texas and, and, and other matters that he killed himself with his own sword. So sort of a kind of a depressing little note there, but I thought it was sort of interesting that he would be the one to go and lead this expedition in Texas for the Mexican government and then Mexican government kind of messes things around and uh, they can't agree on things and the next thing you know he gets so despondent he kills himself. So here's what Mir E. Tehran's report said after he toured Texas. He said that in Texas Anglos outnumbered Mexicans 10 to 1. So that means if there was a population of 10,000 Texans I'm sorry, if there was a population of 10,000 Anglo-Americans in Texas, there were only 1,000 Mexicans. So 10 to 1, that's an incredibly big difference in the number of people in such a short period of time. He said that as he traveled through Texas, the towns there looked like American towns and not Mexican towns. He said that it looked like he could be when he was in a, a, a little Texas settlement, he said it, it could look like a town that you saw in Georgia or Alabama or Mississippi rather than a town that you would expect to find in Mexican controlled Texas. He believed that no more Americans should be allowed in Texas. He believed that immigration from the United States should be ended and that no more Americans allowed in Texas and that only Europeans and Mexicans should be allowed to move to Texas. He felt that if they kept the number of Americans where they were and then started filling in the towns and the areas with more uh, Mexican citizens and more um, citizens from countries in Europe like uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, Germany, uh, started filling them in that, that they wouldn't have that American identity and they wouldn't bring that American sense of, you know, rebellion or whatever with them. He also reported that Texans were buying American made goods and not Mexican made. So if an American farmer was working in his field and he broke a plow and he needed to buy a new one, he would go and he would order uh, a plow that was made in America rather than purchasing a Mexican made plow. Um, because the Americans were more familiar with American made goods and, and they were familiar with the, the things and, and Mexican made stuff was just as good, but it was just, it was made differently. It wasn't what the Americans were familiar with. So the, the Americans, they bought what they were familiar with. And, uh, and of course this made Mary Turan upset and, and many Mexican, um, merchants upset because the Americans weren't buying their goods. They were ordering goods from the United States and having them shipped to Texas. Mira Tehran's report also said that Americans owned slaves, uh, a lot of slaves, although slavery was illegal in Mexico. The Mexican government had just sort of turned a blind eye to the fact that the Americans had slaves, even though the Mexican Constitution of 1824 outlawed slavery in Mexico. Mary Tehran's report recommended strong measures to keep the Anglos from taking over Texas. He wanted to kind of drop the hammer on these Anglo-Americans coming to Texas, or that had, had come to Texas, and he wanted to make sure that, that they understood who the boss was and what country it was that they were living in, and he wanted them to, to make sure that they were living the life of Mexican citizens, not Americans. He believed that Texas should be dependent on Mexico, um, meaning that they should buy Mexican goods, that they should be more reliant on the Mexican government to, to to do things for them. And his recommendations eventually became what is known as the Law of April 6, 1830. The Law of April 6, 1830. Remember that law because it is one that you will hear about a lot here over the next couple of weeks. So the Law of April 6, 1830 Okay, my apologies, I sort of got interrupted there. So um, the law of April 6, 1830, uh, this uh, law that came out of Mir e. Tehran's report, uh, there were five basic parts of it that I want you to remember, and this is the first part. So the law of April 6, 1830, the first part of it is Mir e. Tehran believed that the 
the settlers in Texas would behave a little better if they were supervised. Uh, so he wanted to send more Mexican soldiers to Texas. Now, the gist of this is sort of like if you were walking down the hallway and you came upon another student and you wanted to walk up behind that student and smack him in the back of the head. Um, you might do it. If you're walking down the hall, you may just pass right by and smack that student in the head. But as you're walking down the hall and you're getting close to that student, and you're reaching back to smack him in the head and around the corner walks an assistant principal. Are you going to smack him in the head? Probably not because you don't want to get in trouble. Uh, it's sort of the same idea as if you've ever been driving with your parents and uh, your, your mom or dad's driving and, and all of a sudden up in the distance they see a police car and they kind of tap on the brakes so they slow down. It's because they're being watched and they know that they don't want to they don't want to do anything to get a ticket. Um, Mary Tehran believed that if there were more Mexican soldiers in Texas that, and they had a bigger presence then the Texans, the, the Anglo settlers might be a little more apt to follow the laws and not do anything wild and crazy that, that would be bad. So, uh, remember this term forces sent to Texas forces sent to Texas. Now over on the left hand side, uh, you have this uh, set of questions you know, on the left hand side of your C notes. Uh, and the first question is why did the Mexican government send more soldiers to Texas? So just keep that in mind. You're going to answer that question here in just a little bit. I think we've done a pretty good job of explaining why the Mexican government sent more soldiers to Texas. Uh -huh. The next part of the law of April 6, 1830. Uh, the law of April 6th, 1830 stopped all immigration from the United States into Texas, including slaves. So there was no more immigration uh, from the U.S. into Texas. Now, this made a lot of people in Texas really mad because in a lot of cases, the men, um, the men of a family would move to Texas and would go ahead and start working to build a home, to get the farm up and running, to get their business up and running. And then when they had saved enough money, they would bring their family over back uh, from the United States into Texas. Well, when immigration stopped, it split up families. Um, there were families in, in the United States that couldn't join their, their loved ones in Texas because of the, uh, the stop of immigration. And that takes us to our question here. Oh, remember this, immigration stopped. Okay, so we had forces sent to Texas and now immigration stopped. So think about this question. Answer this in the left-hand column on the, uh, of your C notes there. Was the Mexican government justified in not allowing immigration from the United States into Texas? And why or why not? And this is kind of messed up here, but think about this. The Mexican government outlawed immigration from the United States into Texas. Does this sound familiar to you? Does, can you relate this to anything that might be going on here in our world today? Think about that. All right, the next part of the law of April 6, 1830 is that it suspended all American impresario land grants. So these American impresarios who had been granted land and allowed to bring settlers in, they had their contracts suspended. So they were no longer allowed to bring any Americans into Texas. They had all of the land that they had been granted that had not been settled yet. They had it all kind of put in limbo to where um, they couldn't do anything with it. So remember this, we had forces sent to Texas we had immigration stopped, and now we have suspended impresario contracts. The next part of the law of April 6, 1830, all goods imported into Texas from the United States and Europe were now taxed. We call this uh, a tariff, an import tax. When goods are imported into Texas or today into the United States, the idea is they are taxed higher than usual. What these tariffs do is it makes goods imported from other countries more expensive. 
And if the goods imported from other countries are more expensive, the idea is that the people would not buy them as much as they would buy things made locally. So all goods imported into Texas from the U.S. and Europe were taxed to encourage Texas settlers into buying Mexican goods. So remember this, we had forces sent to Texas, immigration stopped, uh, suspended impresario contracts, and now uh, imports are taxed. So answer this question in the column on the left side of your C notes. Why do you think the Mexican government began taxing goods not made in Mexico? And finally, the last part of the law of April 6th, 1830 was the ban on slavery was enforced in Texas, meaning the Mexican government said, now, Texans, you have to understand, slavery is illegal. So the Americans in Texas, the Anglo-Americans were expected to free their slaves. Uh, the Texans found ways around this. They, they started referring to their slaves, not as basically as slaves, but as indentured, indentured servants. Uh, meaning they said, yes, they were slaves, but now they're just servants and we're, we're making them work off their debt to us because for years and years when they were slaves, we paid for their food, we paid for their shelter, we gave them clothing, and now they're going to have to continue working uh, for us for free until they pay these debts off. So um, even though Mexico had great intentions in saying that the slavery was banned, the Anglo-Americans from Texas uh, and Texas had a way of working around that. So slavery was banned. So remember, forces sent to Texas, immigration stopped, uh, suspended impresario contracts, uh, taxes collected, and now slavery banned. So, in summary of the law of April 6, 1830, instead of becoming more dependent on Mexico, these laws angered the Texans. The laws only affected Texas. They did not affect the rest of Mexico. And Anglos and Tejanos in Texas, meaning the Americans who came to Texas from the United States and Tejanos or Mexican Texans who Mexican citizens who had been living in Texas, they both felt that they were being mistreated by the Mexican government. And this was going to cause the Anglos and the Tejanos to kind of band together uh, to want to resist the Mexican government. So Mexico passed the law of April 6, 1830, uh, and they passed it to sort of keep the Anglo settlers in Texas under control. So you have a set of notes. Uh, if you have a hard copy that you got in class, you've got on the back of your C notes, you have this drawing of a hand. Um, you can, uh, you can use the, the hand drawing that I have provided you in Google Docs, um, or you can draw your own. And if you draw your own, what I'd like you to do is place your left hand palm up on a sheet of paper and trace your hand. So if you're going to do this on your own, you take your left hand, you open it up, spread your fingers apart and lay it down, palm up on a sheet of paper and then trace your hand. And then here's what we're going to do. If you remember, the first part of the law of April 6, 1830, we said what? Forces sent to Texas. The second part of the law of April 6, 1830, we said immigration stopped. The third part, suspended land grants or suspended impresario contracts. The fourth part, we said taxes collected. And then the fifth and final part of the law of April 6, 1830, slavery banned. So if you look at your hand, your thumb, forces sent to Texas, 
index finger, immigration stopped. Middle finger, suspended land grants. Ring finger, taxes collected. And pinky finger, slavery banned. Now, if we think about all three of, or I'm sorry, all five of those things together, fists, F-I-S-T-S, -S, the law of April 13, 18, uh, excuse me, the law of April 6, 1830. If you put them all together, they spell fists, F-I-S-T-S. -S. Now, when you make a fist, you're ready to do what? You're ready to fight. So you had the Anglo settlers of Texas represented by the little praying mantis here. And you had the Mexican government represented by the cat and come at me, bro. So obviously the settlers in Texas were ready for a conflict because they felt they had been treated unfairly. So our summary today, Mexico tried to control Anglo settlers by passing laws that severely limited their rights and actions. So that is it. That is the end of this presentation. Um, I hope you've gotten something out of this. Um, I hope that uh, you've been able to fill out your notes. If you haven't been able to fill them out, go back through this uh, uh, video and make sure that you fill in your notes uh, because we are going to take a quiz over these notes on Monday. So uh, as always, you can use your notes and any, any materials that you have um, that whether it's your key terms, pardon me, your key terms packet, your C notes or the little organizer that we did with the, the hand on the back of the notes. So uh, thanks again for tuning in and um, I'll talk to you next time.